Okay, so thanks a lot for having me here. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the newly named GIGOS Committee on DOIs for Geodetic Data. And you will just see all the, the members of the, the committee. This is too loud, is there? I can't, anyway. So, um, why are we addressing this? If we look back in like 10 years ago, with the beginning of the, of the real digitization, we have new needs for our data. We have to make our data, especially today, um, fit for artificial intelligence, machine learning applications. We have increasingly use of, of HPC computers that require dedicated data models, et cetera, PP. And this is what we have to keep in mind when we want to be still included in the, in the big scientific um, further development. I think one good example for bringing interdisciplinary data together is the, the recently performed um, merge of IRIS, the, the big seismological archive, and UNAFCO, which was the largest geodetic data center in the United States. They are now have been merged to, also for financial reasons, of course, but they are now called Earthscope. But this went along with the uh, um, a data and metadata harmonization step because they had to divert to change their, their systems to cope with the two different types of data. And I would say that both GNSS data and seismological data are among the most standardized already. But still, it took a long while. And this is what we have to think about. Another example I recently heard, heard during a conference in Berlin. It was that um, it's an example from Australia where they kind of develop a platform where you can collaboratively use and process and model different types of geophysical and geodetic data. And this is, of course, done on an HPC computer. Um, they use the raw data, and they put a lot of effort to really bring the data in the same format. Um, and, but having achieved this for the subset of Australian data, you can really do very fast joint inversion of, of multidisciplinary geophysical data. And this, I, I guess, it is coming up. And on the other hand, we, we also see new highly data intensive methods. I know the distributed acoustic censoring of the seismology where they use telecommunication cables to really measure very, very high resolution. And I'm already getting a bit fear of getting these data in my repository. So this is what we have to keep in mind when we speak about any type of data harmonization, standardization. On the other hand, we are in the middle of the open science movement, which means whenever we write a proposal, we are supposed to um, state that the data and how the data is made publicly available. We are all funded by public money, and we are supposed to give them the, our research results back to the public of course, not without being acknowledged, but still it, there are increasingly demands on, on internationally. The, I think the most recent is the UNESCO recommendation on open science. We all know when we write papers that we, are about to, to, we have to, to provide data availability statements, increasingly code availability statements, because they want to possibly reuse or reprocess the, the modeling steps that you are publishing. We speak about data management plans, data citations, which provide credit, and of course, um, an increasing number of repositories that can help the research community to, to, to make everything possible that is required on that, on that end. OK, DOIs are certainly not the overall solution for everything, but I think they're an important part for supporting the, the development for making data fair, because they are directly accessible via a, a link. It means they can be found by your computers and each machine knows what to do. So by having this UI link, you can directly reach the data. So the accessibility is granted. Um, in most cases, it directly links to the data used for a specific research result published in a specific paper. So you can assess the data and try to find out whether you can produce the same results, which is really crucial for the validation and verification of the data. And, and this is what we are mostly dealing with in the DOI committee, the data once published with the DOI are accompanied by machine actionable metadata. And these metadata are provided in international standards, which are valid across all disciplines. 
and they should include persistent identifiers like org IDs for persons, the raw for research institutions, and the metadata working group of DataSite, which is one of the DUI registration agencies, strongly recommends to also make sure that um, you have cross-references, like you have a link to the paper under data, or if you have a data compilation that you include all the source references in the machine-readable metadata. And by doing such, um, you can make sure that you don't need persons to tell because machines can already see, oh, that's the data, and here's the long list of references. I can direct you further processes and get the persons right because of the orchids, etc. pp. And this is, why is this proceeding? Anyway. <laughs> and DOIs are citable, like data sets um, with DOIs are citable in the literature. And this is really new because when I was studying and doing my PhD, you were not allowed to add a data citation because journal said we only publish, uh, we only cite, we no longer allow the citation of peer-reviewed data, uh, peer-reviewed articles. This changed and I think we can use this possibility to get credit, especially for the institutions producing the data by using DUIs, okay? So that was one of the rational, I think the main, main rational for founding, for implementing this GIGOS DUI working group. Um, and we have been working for four years and have been somehow promoted to a committee on DOIs at the last IUGG meeting. And this means that we can continue and you, won't, you might see me again at similar occasions <laughs> um, with presenting what we are doing. Our group members are representatives of, diff of IAG services and of global geodetic data centers that are already doing DOIs or are interested in, and the aim is definitely to, to consolidate and to, to harmonize the efforts that no matter where we are, we can at least compare the metadata and make it then harmonize and avoid people doing this at a later stage. And of course, it's about best practices, not only what to put in the metadata, but what are the objects a DOI is assigned to. Is it the data itself or the um, product or the compilation? That's everything we speak about. So what are we doing? We discuss. We have meetings, teleconferences, more or less regular. I would say every, my aim is every two months, but I have now already been delayed a bit. We speak about different ge geodetic data types and products. Uh, you all know that I'm not a geodesist, so I have to learn a lot, and I'm really happy that we have these discussions. We have, we address hierarchical data products. We speak about metadata, data citations, persistent identifier, the FAIR principles, of course. And we are about to draft um, a document with our metadata recommendations. It says for GNSS, but this is just the first use case because we have been addressing it, I think, but I come back to this. And of course, we regularly present our outcomes, our our steps, our, our work during different conferences and, and workshops in geodesy and beyond. So what we have to acknowledge, we cannot provide a, one, a single one-fits-all solution because the data are so variable that it's, it's not possible. So we have to look a bit broader and we might come or we will come with different re um, recommendations for different types or data products. We have also to acknowledge that different countries or institutions may follow different strategies and have different governmental regulations. I think it's not possible to think about this one geodetic data center. I know that there will be the GIGOS portal, but this is not the repository. It is then the place where all repositories are asked for to provide the metadata. And this can be the, the central place for finding the data, but the data are archived in these repositories. So we have to to be a bit inclusive and not to say, no, we have to do it all like we do at GFZ, for example. And of course, we want to follow the rules for good scientific practice, which mainly means cite the sources and acknowledge the people and the, the institutions who have done the work. We have easy cases and more difficult cases. The easy cases are certainly the static data. And they are, for example, GOIs for GNSS campaign data. And we have, for example, dedicated DOI minting services for specific IAG services, namely for the ICGEM and ISG services, which are static or temporal gravity models. And because ICGEM is running at GFZ, it was our first 
collaboration with GFZ Data Services, our repository, to really offer this to the geodetic community, and we have a similar approach for the ISG, somehow as an outcome of this of this working group, actually. For the dynamic data, there are a bit more challenges because we have high temporal resolution, you have real-time data. We have ever-changing products that are possibly only valid for a very short time. Are we supposed to put DOIs on this or does it make sense or anything? We have often many authors. I know the first IVS data set has more than 300 authors for the ITRF 2014. And we have different processing levels. So um, we start really more general to say, whenever possible, we recommend to use a DOI for a product type. This may be the raw data. This may be the first level, two level. This is not identifying a specific data file, but the product, and it's mainly served, serving for citation purposes, very similar to the DOI for seismic networks. Um, of course, we have to also look at the rules for DOI minting. So when, a, when a, an institution is not planning to archive any ultra rapid products for the long term, we cannot put a DOI on because we have to guarantee that the data are accessible even 10 years after the publication. So that is something we have to clearly state and to make people aware of. And um, we have already developed one, one use case for a hierarchical product, for example, where we have different analysis centers providing solutions for a specific um, product that are then combined to a combination product. And then, of course, we have to discuss who are the authors who would be a neutral publisher. I know that these discussions are currently very active in the, in the ITRF 2020 for all the different disciplines, and Daniela is, is leading them with IRS. But I think um, this is something that is really worth um, thinking of. So examples are just like GNSS. There are already network DOIs for GNSS. We have for iGets also a DOI minting service, which is has an inter interesting ad ad additional feature <clears throat> because we have this one data report describing the full data product, uh, levels, repositories, and everything. No, uh, stations, observatories. So every one of you who runs a supralight gravity station doesn't need to describe it because this report is there. They only need to cite the report and describe the local specifications of their station. So that makes it quite easy for people to just contribute. We have, of course, um, temporal and topography graphic gravitational models that are also archived with ICGEM and included in the DUI minting service. And we have um, Grace, Grace for Loan data products, including for the level three products for the time series within Gravis, which are the most dedicated ones for interdisciplinary use. And on the other hand, I think many of you have seen this, that is the concept of this hierarchical DUI as the, on the example of COSG, where we really make the connection between the source solutions and the combination product in the DUI metadata and can give clear guidelines on how to do this. Um, for GNSS, we have discussed a lot. It's not, not very easy. Easy are campaign data, as I showed. We can use them for products, which is very similar to what we said, including the rapid, ultra rapid, but we cannot directly use I recommend to use GNSS networks because in contrast to seismic networks that are strictly hierarchical, they are not always organized as a network. And some stations may be part of several networks, some stations may not be part of a network. or So it's not really clear that once one group is organizing one network and therefore you can cite the network. And therefore, within the group, we had to come to the idea of using one DOI for the data of a station. This is not a DOI for the station. That would be a different identifier, but it's really for the data. So we are speaking yet again about dynamic data, ongoing time series, but from a station. I know that GNSS data is really very, very large, and we have to think about scalability. But if we approach this, we have like this example for the 11 stations, and each data has this little DOI. And then we can create the relations via the metadata. And this can be done in the data site metadata schema using the related identifier um, property. So this is possible. It doesn't mean that this is easy. And I hope that many of you have like um, 
digital data or software or data management systems for or metadata systems for, for GNSS data, then it could be could be scalable. But you see the, the broad range of, of things we are speaking. And especially because we had many, many discussions on GNSS data in the last year, we have started to, to address these metadata recommendations based on the GNSS use case. And because of the high granularity, we, we will make sure that there is a maximum automatization. So any, and especially between the geodesy ML of site lock files and the DUI metadata. So ideally we identify existing information in geodesy ML files that are then semi-automatically or automatically mapped into the metadata that people do not need to, to write anything because this doesn't make sense. And this metadata recommendations also include a general introduction, what you uh, have to do, where you get your DOI, what about the strategies, and the actual status of this that we are, um, it's currently in discussion. I, I was receiving several comments and I'm currently about to, to implement them. There will be questions that we need to address. The IEGS governing board, namely Ryan, has already provided valuable feedback. And the idea is, and I'm still, we, ha we are already in autumn 23, but I, I really hope that I can publish the first version, at least for public comments, um, by the end of this year, I think, before AGU. So what are questions that are remaining related to the recommendations? Of course, they have a general part and then a more specific part. And my question is, will be, and then if you have the opportunity of looking at it, how much of the recommendations can be also applied to other geodetic data? I think um, it would be ideal that we have this general recommendations, use UIs, uh, use ORCIDs, relate, use, use the related identifier, use RAW, et cetera, that is applicable for all geodetic data, but then have more specific guidelines for these are the items I would I would suggest to map from geodesy ML into that field of the metadata. Um, yeah, that's more or less what I've said, but now it's written. <laughs> I think another issue is how can we assure that DUI metadata is harmonized across repositories or even DUI registration agencies? I know that the Japanese, like in Japan, they have their own registration agency. They're not bound to use data site metadata. Using a metadata scheme, agreeing on a specific way to, to report the metadata is a really big step to to, um, to harmonize. So this is a challenge we have to address. Maybe we need two mappings, one to the Japanese registration agency, one to data site. That is what, what we will develop in the, in the future. And of course, how can we teach our data users to cite the data? That is really something that is much more than technical. Yeah. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Kirsten, for this very interesting uh, presentation. So, are there questions? So, Harald, please. Concerning the question on your second light, uh, second last slide, this one, the second bullet point. My personal guess is that we really would need individual recommendations for different techniques. But of course, GNSS can be used as a kind of template. Yes. But probably yeah. at the end, because SLR might, there are a lot of similarities with individual stations. VLBI has a different concept. You always need at least two stations and you have networks. So yeah. uh, I think individual recommendations are needed, but GNSS yeah. can be used as an example. Yeah, well, if you look at the, the file at the moment, at the, at the document, you will see that it is much, very, very generic. This is how you provide information on authors and on the affiliation and everything. I wonder if we could have like subchapters, like specific recommendations, because the last. But I think from the data level, um, even though the the techniques are very different, but the data are. If you, if you step one back, one step back, and you look really on the data, you have time series, and you may have standards. And if you have standards, then of course. We follow them. I don't know if there are, for example, similar things to site logs or geodesy ML for, for SLR data, data. I don't know. This is something for me. Geod uh, GNSS data is 
really highly standardized already because of the writings and signings files that are agreed upon the international community. I don't know, I will have to ask if the VLBI or SLR and other techniques have, have a similar level of standardization, then it would make, would make it easy. But this would mean that the mapping is different. Yeah. Okay, there's another question. Yeah, exactly. So uh, uh, it is following your discussions that now you had. So basically, I think we need maybe one part that GIGOS can be active on is uh, producing and uh, actually making uh, some documents like standards that we should follow. Because, for example, we have NSS data, but uh, the documentation is not enough. So, and what we need to do again, and that's why we cannot trust in the data, and then we would, be, we, we would prefer to waste the budget and then again to uh, have a uh, like a experiment set up again the stations why because the documentation is not good enough to explain us for example sometimes just the height is changed after uh, i mean the height of this station and it's not reported and that's why we cannot use anymore you know these uh, stations for example for some applications i mean and uh, basically one part that we can be active is first of all i think we should define what are geodetic data so as still it is a to me a question. So we are talking a lot about the classic data sets like VLBI, SLR, GNSS, but the point is we have also new data sets which other communities are using and taking the advantage of them as not referencing to geodesy, but publishing them as other data sets. So we need also to define that these new data sets and also as standards, how to publish them and also to define the processing levels. What data is level zero to level three or four? And, and then I think it would be a good approach for us. Yeah. Well, I think on uh, the definition of the data levels has to be done within the scientific community because I, I'm, a, I'm a data publishing person. I can bring you everything that makes it visible, accessible, describable, and citable. So this, these kind of standards have to be, must be developed within the groups. But as soon as you come up with a standard, and I was really wondering that you say you cannot trust GNSS data because, well, the cases I know at GFZ, we have a really good metadata based images, and all the changes are recorded because, of course, we are aware that each change of, of instrument or of part of the instrument may lead in a, in a switch, or like when we've been visiting the absolute gravity meter field, no, the, the, the measurement house yesterday. Um, Esther went to, to say, okay, we have been in this room with, I don't know how many people from that time to that time, because this will be recorded in the data. And I think my experience with what I know from GFZ, there might be others, but the the way of noting these changes and these interferences is, is pretty, pretty much advanced. There might be countries where they don't have a dedicated metadata base, but still, I think most do because of the relevance. And for the rest, I would say one step after the other. Let us start with something, and then, of course, we, we know, and I mean, we all heard Alison's um, talk on on the UN report that didn't mention geodesy at all, but used the geodesy results for claiming or for, for indicating climate change. This is definitely something we have to address, and the more the data used out of the closer geodesy community, the more important it is to really document it. <laughs> 